welcome to you all uh, for this uh, inaugural lecture, uh, uh, at least an inaugural lecture, and a new lecture series uh, that is hosted by the King's Health Partners. Um, my name is Richard Trembath. I'm the current executive director uh, of our academic health science centre, King's Health Partners. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this, the inaugural lecture in what we are terming, terming our Professor Sir Robert Leckler lecture series titled Frontiers in Health. So, before I introduce formally our, our speaker this evening, um, can I just say a few words about King's Health Partners? Now, I might reasonably assume this is well known to most of not all of you, uh, but just, just to re emphasize, if I may, that King's Health Partners is, is formally designated by uh, the Department of Health is one of only eight such centres in uh, academic health science across England. In essence, however, the purpose of King's Health Partners is to deepen our relationship between our university and our major healthcare trusts, Guys of St. Thomas's, King's College Hospital, and South London and the Maudsley. And this is really, the purpose of this is to uh, really respond and address major health challenges that we face locally, nationally, and globally. King's Health Partners achieves this by integrating our research, education, training to drive broader health improvement and to address those significant and as yet unmet health needs. So the central tenet that sits behind this new annual lecture series is to consider the contemporary landscape, the barriers that we need to overcome, and approaches to harness innovation to address those significant healthcare challenges. And to launch this series, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Professor Sir Robert Leckler as this evening's inaugural lecturer. Now Robert is indeed, I'm sure, well known, if not to most, and I rather suspect all of you. And Robert is widely recognized uh, for his many contributions to medical science, including, of course, through his knighthood. His role in academic leadership is also broad. He joined King's in 2004, and in the summer, uh, and up until the time he stepped down from his role as Senior Vice President for Health uh, in the summer of 2020, he had overseen very significant expansion in the health-related and health-related sciences across King's. And of course, in 2008, led the initial application for designation of our AHSC, leading to the formation of King's Health Partners. And so, if I may, to use a phrase I've certainly heard him use on many occasions, uh, but not to my knowledge have I ever heard him uh, say it of himself, I cannot think of a better person to give the inaugural uh, lecture in this plea Professor Sir Robert Leckler lecture series, Frontiers in Health. And so may I welcome Robert. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for that kind introduction. Um, and it's genuinely an honor uh, to have this lecture series um, in my name. And it's a privilege to be asked to give uh, the first uh, in this, what I think is going to be an annual series. Um, so before I go any further, um, can I just give a big thank you to Tom Falks, who's in the audience, who's helped to populate uh, the slides that I'm going to show you this evening. Because um, what I'm going to do is give you a talk that is uh, really broadly into two chapters. The first chapter, I'll be setting out for you the challenges that our healthcare system uh, is grappling with and confronting. 
And I hope persuade you, if you need persuading, that they are greater in scale and intensity than any time in early history. So this photograph, therefore, is a photograph of London at dawn because your folklore tells you that red sky in the morning is a shepherd's warning. The second chapter, I'm going to change gear completely and suggest to you that the solutions that are within our grasp are more than sufficient to meet those challenges if we seize the opportunity they present. So this is a photograph of London at sunset because you know that red sky at night is shepherd's delight. So that's where I'm going to take you. But before we get into either of those chapters, um, let's just take a, a dive back in history and celebrate the extraordinary advances in health that were achieved in the 20th century. They were quite extraordinary. So just starting with life expectancy, which was grumbling along at around 40 years for centuries until the start of the 20th century when it just took off. And that's true in all countries um, that have been studied. And if we project that onto a map of the world and look at it over a time frame, we're starting in the 1700s. Now, of course, to begin with, not very much was measured. But as things started to get measured in Europe and then North America uh, and then soon comes Australia, the life expectancy, when it started to be measured, South America was around 50 years. And then you get to the start of the 20th century, and very extraordinary things start to happen. So almost all the globe starts turning some color of green or blue, meaning life expectancy is getting up into the 70s and even into the 80 years. And when you come right up to the present day, really the only part of the world that still needs acute attention is sub-Saharan Africa. Also, dramatic reductions in infant mortality. Uh, and this is actually a much shorter time frame. It's being compared on left and right. So the darker the color, the higher the infant mortality. This is 200 deaths per 1,000 live births in, still, in parts of Africa. But you can see how much that's improved over those 30 years. And if we just look at the UK, specifically over a 20-year period, this is infant mortality over uh, from 2000 to 2020. This is deaths per 1,000 life births, and it just steadily comes down. But you'll notice at this point there are significant variations between countries. That's something I'll come back to later. And the factors driving the uh, improvements in infant mortality are multiple. Of course, the advent of antibiotics, much better neonatal care, the introduction of surfactant for premature babies. You see that being administered here. Better maternal care in childbirth. And then vaccination. Vaccination has changed the world. Uh, and an early success was the eradication of smallpox, a great achievement by the human race in 1980. Polio almost eradicated. These are children in iron lungs, something you never see these days needing mechanical support to breathe. Meningitis, MMR, a great success, despite the efforts of a certain Dr. Wakefield. Uh, hepatitis, tetanus. More recently, moving into this century, human papillomavirus addressing cervical cancer risk, Ebola, and then the extraordinary COVID-19 vaccine story that I'm sure you've heard enough of. But it really was an extraordinary feat within about a year of a virus being identified to produce a vaccine that has completely changed the face of this pandemic. In terms of where we're going from here, well, I'm sure you're, you've heard about the very exciting results coming out of the Jenner Institute in Oxford, led by Adrian Hill, with the promise of a vaccine that's actually going to reduce the global burden of malaria. HIV and AIDS, what a phenomenal transformation that has been. In the early days of the epidemic, as I'm sure you know, a diagnosis of HIV was a death sentence. No longer is that true. It's now a chronic disease and basically does not impact on your lifespan. So great successes to celebrate. The final one I want to mention to you is cardiovascular disease. I had to do that. We have a BHF center here, uh, led by Mara Jacker, as I recall. Uh, but cardiovascular disease um, has dr declined dramatically over the 50-year period shown here to about a quarter of what it was. And that's the result of multiple interventions, M massive fall in the prevalence of smoking, better management of blood pressure, the advent of statins, and better management of acute coronary presentations. So, really a century of remarkable progress and remarkable success. And just hold that for this next chapter of my talk because it should encourage us to believe that we can do it again.
because unfortunately that century has been followed by two decades of decline leading what, to what I'm describing as an impending crisis. So start off with uh, life expectancy. Unfortunately, that has now plateaued, and in some geographies in the UK and the US, for the first time in human history, life expectancy is actually declining. But worse than that, the increase in life expectancy has not been paralleled by an increase in healthy life expectancy, which is in a sense what really matters. And you're looking here at some data published in The Lancet last year, uh, looking at changes in healthy life years from 2008 to 2016 in men and women. This is the UK, a decrease in the number of healthy life years over that time period compared to a number of our European counterpart countries. Now, if you have any association with King's or King's Health Partners, then I'm sure you're aware of the tsunami of mental ill health that is sweeping across the UK and, of course, other developed countries too. So much so that it's estimated that one in six young people are estimated to suffer from a diagnosable disorder. And you probably also know that about 50% of adult mental ill health has its antecedents before the age of 14. So this tsunami, unfortunately, has a long way to run and is a real concern. Now, Layered on top of all of that is this ghastly issue of health inequalities, and you'll be familiar with Michael Marmot, who's uh, propagated the concept of social determinants of health, a very important theme that he's championed. And he ran, re-ran his review 10 years after his first review of health inequality, and the depressing conclusion essentially was that we've not improved in closing the gap, and in fact, in a number of instances, those inequalities have got worse. And of course, if the COVID pandemic did one thing, you had to pick one thing, it was to exaggerate inequality. So here you're looking at it in very stark form. This is healthy life year expectancy in males and females in the UK. This is the 10% best off fraction of the population. This is the 10% worst off fraction. And it's a stubborn gap of 10 years. Essentially, if you plot deprivation score against healthy life years, it's a linear relationship for both men and women. Now, in years gone by, I used to contrast Hull and Hampshire when talking about inequality of life expectancy. But you don't need to look far afield. This is a map of Southwark, a key catchment area for the King's Health Partners Hospitals. Um, and this is looking at male life expectancy on the right. And if you look in the leafy oasis of Dulwich Village and maybe some residents of Dulwich in the audience tonight, uh, the male life expectancy here is around 85 years. If you look at some of the needy wards up in Bermondsey, it's 75 years. So within one borough of London, within a few miles of each other, are men with a life expectancy that's 10 year different. It's absolutely scandalous. Now, another impending problem that is coming our way, uh, unless we do something very dramatic, is the problem of climate change. And so the WHO estimates that in decades to come, there'll be an additional 250,000 deaths as a result of climate change. And the reason I mention it here is twofold, really. The first is that I think it behoves us to get more serious about researching what the causal links are between climate change and ill health. And secondly, that there's an intersection between climate change and its impact and inequalities again, because higher heat wave temperatures tend to peak in inner cities and urban areas and especially high rise um, accommodation. And it's great that in King's forward strategy, you've chosen to prioritize climate uh, as one of your strategic priorities. Now, layered on top of climate change, of course, is deteriorating air quality. And depressingly, the European Environment Agency concludes that the vast majority of Europe's urgent population is exposed to unsafe levels of air pollution. And this has a disproportionate effect on children and the impact of changing this would be substantial. So if we could reduce particulates by 10 micrograms per cubic meter, that would extend lifespan by five times more than eradicating road traffic accidents, three times more than eradicating the effects of passive smoking. Uh, and there's an emerging theme that suggests that actually air pollution is not just causing a respiratory disease, but driving cancer. Again, there's a link with health inequality because the uh, air quality tends to be worst in the dense urban centers, uh, and that's where the people less well off tend to live. 
So let's turn then to, from population health to our health system and the challenges that it's facing. And again, I'm sure these are all very familiar to you. So the first is steadily rising costs. And they were rising before the pandemic, year on year. And then, of course, post-pandemic, there's been a very sharp upturn. Now, some of that, of course, is due to the aging of the population, which you could say, in a sense, is a success story. But it's a problem, too, because by 2040, it's predicted that 25% of the population uh, will be having freedom passes and over the age of 65. And, of course, with that comes increased spend because the cost of managing the 80-year-old population is about six times that of 30-year-olds. And much of that, of course, is, again, as you well know, is due to the problem of multimorbidity. So here, this is showing the percentage of patients that have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven disorders at the same time over increasing age. And so the younger populations usually just have a single disease. But as you get into your 70s, about 50% have several conditions simultaneously, adding, of course, to the complexity. Layered on top of all of that is a rather unhelpful social demographic in the UK because what's happening is that cities are tending to get younger and rural communities are tending to get older. So the colour coding here, the darker the colour, the older the population, uh, and you can see the conurbations are light in colour, reflecting their young age, rel relatively speaking. And so this is translated on the right-hand side into journey time to access secondary care. So what this tells you is the people with the greatest health needs are living furthest from where they're currently delivered. Now let's then have a little look at how the NHS is performing. Now we all love the NHS, at least I hope we do. I certainly do. I spent my whole professional life working in one way or another within it uh, and continue to care hugely about it. But sometimes referred to as our national religion, but like most religions, it's having a tough time. Uh, and if we do some international comparisons, it's not a great picture. So here's the waiting list problem, which again, you've heard so much about in the press, steadily increasing up to the pandemic, dipping then when GPs stopped referring patients in the early stages of the pandemic, and then climbing horribly to a level we've never seen before, around 7 million people waiting for elective care. It's an enormous burden on an already stressed system. Now, if we then compare ourselves with other countries, I'm only showing you a couple of things here. This one is treatable mortality rates. This is an OECD study comparing 18 countries like us. Uh, and I'm afraid we are down at position 17 out of 18. You'll notice the United States is 18 out of 18. The differences here are not trivial. So the most successful, Australia, France, Treatable mortality rates are about 50 per 100,000. We're 50% up on that at 75. Now, you might say, well, this is just because we don't spend enough. And you're partially right, if that's what you think. So we are, in terms of spend per capita of the population, at about position 12 in this ranking of 18. You'll notice that the United States is way out on top. It's almost double its closest competitor for spend, which is Germany. So it's the country that spends by far the most and has the worst outcome. So that tells you there's not a linear relationship between spend and health. Um, you'll also notice that Japan, that has better outcomes than us, actually spends slightly less than us. But if you compare us to our European counterparts, then I think it's absolutely true. We are underspending by about 10% compared to our neighboring countries. And I hope that uh, Jeremy Hunt is listening. Uh, and for sure, when he comes up with his next utterance, there must not be a cut uh, in healthcare spend, and there will need to be an increase over ensuing years, for sure. In terms of cancer outcomes, again, it's not a great picture. Uh, the same OECD ranking, uh, we are, tend to be number 18 for most of these cancers in terms of outcome. Significant differences, I mean, take UK stomach cancers, five-year survival at 20%. Um, the average for those 18 was 30%, and of course some countries doing substantially better than that. And this triggered um, a select committee inquiry which reported last year and uh, identified a number of issues responsible for our poor cancer outcomes, including late diagnosis, of course. Um, but they also identified a problem with gaps in the workforce. And that, I think, is the last problem that I want to share with you. The workforce in health and care is in a truly parlous state. So there are 130,000 unfilled posts in secondary care at the moment. 
uh, a shortage of doctors, a shortage of nurses, a structural issue because a lot of doctors are coming up to retirement, and depressingly in surveys, over 40% are planning early retirement because they're stressed and they're burnt out and they're demoralized, and there's similarly vac similar vacancy rates uh, in the social care system. So, end of chapter one, you'll be relieved to hear. And um, just to catalogue where I've taken you, life expectancy, having seen massive increases, has plateaued and is declining for the first time in human history in some regions. Glaswegian women, I think, is one example. The gains in life expectancy have not been matched by equivalent gains in healthy life years. Health inequalities are indefensible and widening. Demands on the health service are rising year on year and have been exaggerated by the pandemic, of course. The costs are also rising. The workforce is in crisis and the performance of the NHS is creaking and groaning under the strain. Now, why have I gone through all of that? It's not to depress the mood at all. It's for two reasons. It's one, that any of us that have the chance to influence anybody with our hands on political levers needs to understand the gravity of this situation and the consequence of not doing the right thing in terms of investment. But secondly, I regard this as a kind of call to action for all of us that are engaged in any way with implementing the sort of solutions that I'm going to outline for you now, which I think we do have the power to begin to deliver. So, switch of gear, switch of tone to um, opportunity. I think we are entering a decade of unprecedented opportunity. That's in part because biomedical science is advancing at a remarkable pace, driven by new technologies, new discoveries, and increasing crosstalk between disciplines. And I do want to emphasize that. That's, for example, medicine and engineering, which is alive and well here at King's, social science and medicine, behavioral science and medicine. We've got a guru in behavioral science in the audience. All these disciplines, I think, need to work together. And if they do so, the future's bright. So there are three buckets of opportunity that I'm going to briefly cover. The first is a fresh approach to disease prevention and health promotion. It's been underinvested in historically. The second is uh, re-engineering our healthcare system, which has largely been the same since the NHS was formed 70 years ago. And the third is to double down on de developing curative therapies, which, again, I think are within our grasp. So let me uh, briefly touch on each of those in turn. So in terms of prevention and health promotion, I think we just need to get a bit smarter. We talk a lot about personalized medicine. I think we're moving into an era when we can think about personalized prevention, much better targeted uh, screening and health promotion strategies. That will be assisted by risk stratification, both genetic, environmental, and behavioral, of groups and individuals. Um, and some of the genetics, as you know, has already led to polygenic risk scores that identify fractions of the population at greater risk of certain chronic diseases. That's come out of the UK Biobank, a national treasure, I would suggest, to be supplemented, I hope you've heard, by Our Future Health, which is this extraordinary initiative to get cohorts of five million volunteers who are going to be analyzed inside and out and followed over time to give us deeper insights into causation of disease uh, and risk stratification. And then innovative digital approaches, I think, are going to play a part too. I'm sure you've all followed, in one way or another, the Zoe app, which grew out of King's and had a major role in the pandemic. And I still get a daily feed from the Zoe app, which tracks very precisely uh, the shape of the pandemic. Um, it's now being put to the use for which it was originally intended, which is personalized nutrition and health. But a number of us are having discussions about whether we can build on that Zoe app, which was a great piece of citizen science, and develop something that will be usable by the most needy sectors of our local populations to give us real-time data feeds on uh, lifestyle choices, behaviors, healthy behaviors, unhealthy behaviors, link that to some reward mechanism, and then link that in turn to community-based health coaching. I think these are the sorts of things that create the possibility of shifting the dial. And data is, of course, all important in getting this right. And I'm pleased to say that London is making progress in developing a data strategy across the major AHSCs that Richard's talked about um, in linking primary care, secondary care, social care, and even education data sets in the way that uh, Matthew Hotoff and colleagues uh, have led at the IOPPN. And I think smart use of all this data will allow us to make real inroads into population health. What about the second opportunity, re-engineering uh, the healthcare system? 
Well, I think there are great opportunities here, and I think in some regards the way we do deliver healthcare is quite unproductive. So AI and technology are part of this, and this is a photograph from Aravind Haikare, I Care, who work in India and sub-Saharan Africa, using teleophthalmology to make remote diagnosis uh, and interpretation by AI. And of course, that's alive and well in our own healthcare system increasingly. So Google Health came up with an AI algorithm that uh, interprets mammograms and outperforms specialists in detecting cancer and reduces the false positive rate. And that's now being applied across multiple diagnostic pathways. Sensing technology, again, I think is going to be an important field of movement. It's already in the clinic, of course, glucose monitoring, linked to closed-loop insulin delivery to give you much better diabetic control. But there are now ingestible sensors uh, to monitor antipsychotic drug consumption, smart contact lenses to detect vitreous pressure changes in glaucoma, and monitors that give you early warning of a, an asthma attack for those with severe asthma. But I think this sense of technology has still got some way to go to monitor a range of physiological parameters. And we had a recent visit from John Rogers, who's probably the world leader in sensor technology from Northwestern University. Now, the relevance of this to redesigning pathways is that sophisticated use of sophisticated sensors should allow more care for long-term conditions in the home setting safely, provided it's surrounded by the right kind of community nurse that themselves have digital competence. Now, we host at King's, as many of you will know, an AI center um, that was set up by Reza Razavi and now run by Seb Orsola that is using these kinds of technologies to redesign pathways across a range of disease settings. And I want to just share with you the caricature of one pathway um, that, to me, uh, makes a lot of sense, and that's the headache pathway. Now, the current way that the headache pathway tends to work is you start suffering from headaches and you self-medicate for a while and eventually you get an appointment with your GP. The GP says, well, you're a bit stressed, Robert, so take a week off work and come back and see me if it's things aren't better, which they're not. So you've got a follow-up appointment. And then the GP says, well, you better see the specialist. Oh, he or she thinks I've got a brain tumor, you immediately assume. Three months later, at best, you see the specialist. The specialist says, well, just to be safe, we'd better get an MR scan. Oh, he or she thinks I've got a brain tumor. So then a while later, you get your scan. That's interpreted by a radiologist, sent to the neurologist. You have your follow-up appointment sometime later. 98% of the time, there's nothing anatomically amiss. So you get referred back to the GP who puts you in the migraine service. This pathway lasts at least six months. It's a miserable patient experience. It's full of anxiety. It's full of wasted time, days off work. And neurologists spent 50% of their time seeing patients with headaches. The way the pathway could work, maybe a little bit fantastical, but not totally, you start developing headaches, you get an online consultation quickly, or you even talk to an, a, a chat bot using natural language processing, which then triages you to say you need a scan. Now, one Tesla MR scans now will be sitting in Boots the Chemist, so you can get your scan a few days later. Uh, that's reported by an AI algorithm, electronically sent to the GP. You see the GP a week later who says it's all fine. Go in the community migraine service. That pathway lasts a matter of days, and it's a much better patient experience with possibly a better clinical outcome and, of course, much less cost. Now, I'm the first to recognize that changing pathways is a lot more difficult than it is to say and uh, that's partly why it doesn't happen very often. So I think we need to build capability, I would suggest, in the NHS for real system engineering. It's a particular skill that's going to come actually from engineering schools, coupled with behavioral scientists, coupled, of course, with clinicians driving the process. But I think there is potential. Finally, the final big opportunity, curative therapies. Very, very exciting time uh, in biomedicine. And I'm going to mention four technologies, one of which I've already referred to, AI. The relevance of AI to developing new therapies is illustrated by the AlphaFold program of Google DeepMind. They've used this to solve protein structures. Now, any of you scientists will know that solving a protein structure normally is very laborious. You have to grow a crystal of the protein and then subject it to crystallographic analysis, and it takes months, if not years. Alpha, the AlphaFold program, they predicted the structure of nearly all proteins known to man in a period of 18 months. And what this then allows is for you to make smart drugs. So you identify the active site of an enzyme or the binding site to a receptor, and you can generate a small molecule that will interfere with the function of that protein. 
The second exciting area is gene therapy and gene editing. Of course, you'll have heard about this. It's in the clinic already for kids with uh, immunodeficiency, for example. But take a disease like sickle cell. We've got the largest sickle cell practice in the country at KCH. A very big disease burden, of course, in sub-Saharan Africa. Lends itself to gene editing. So it's a matter of isolating the bone marrow-derived stale cells, editing the beta globin gene, and putting them back. They're autolog it's an autologous transplant. So again, clinical trials of this approach are underway in the States and looking extremely promising in terms of cure. Now, there are a large number of monogenic disorders which potentially would be candidates for gene editing and gene therapy. It may even be that some polygenic diseases may also benefit if they're sort of driver master genes in those particular diseases. The third uh, area that's, again, very exciting is our ability to manipulate the immune system. Uh, now, in the case of cancer, of course, what the, the, the aim here is to turn the immune system on and persuade it to attack something that it's currently ignoring. And success has arisen from so-called checkpoint inhibitors that take the brakes off the immune system, or CAR T cells, which is taking a population of white cells that kill cancer cells, arming them genetically with the receptor that drives their attention to the tumor. And combining these sorts of approaches, a number of cancers that were untreatable are now treatable, and I think the ambition should be to create cures. Now, the other side of this coin is immune tolerance. That's turning the immune system off and persuading it to ignore something that it's currently attacking, and that's relevant to autoimmunity in my own field, transplantation. And if you'll indulge me for a very brief diversion into what's happening in transplantation that we've been engaged with, uh, it involves a population of cells called regulatory cells. Now, some of you may never have, I don't want to add to your worry list, but you may never have thought about why your immune system doesn't reject you. Why does it tolerate you? And the reason it's an extraordinary feat is that there's nothing categorically different about your proteins from those of a bacteria. They're just proteins get broken down into peptides. You recognize the ones from bacteria. Most of the time, you ignore the ones from your own proteins. Why do you do that? Well, partly it's because of these so-called regulatory T cells. It's a population of white blood cell whose job it is to damp down unwanted immune responses. They're made in the thymus. They circulate in the peripheral blood. They're present in all mammalian species that have been studied. And if you don't have them, you get autoimmunity. So we, and we as myself and Giovanna Lombardi, my wife, posed a very simple question a few years ago. Could we hijack this population of cells and persuade it to prevent transplant rejection? So uh, what we did was borrowed the CAR technology from the cancer field. So this is a portion, the antibody bind, that, sorry, the, the binding site of an antibody. Uh, we put that onto these uh, regulatory T cells to target the attention of the regulatory T cells to a transplanted organ, and then did some sophisticated manipulation of the signaling machinery, which I won't bore you with now. And then we tested this model in mouse models, where it certainly worked very well to prevent transplant rejection. And then we moved into what's called a humanized mouse model. So that's taking a mouse that has no immune system because of various gene modifications, putting onto that mouse a piece of human skin that, of course, a normal mouse would reject, but this mouse can't, letting it bed in for four weeks, and then putting in a human immune system that will reject the transplant, and then testing the capability of these modified regulatory cells to prevent rejection. This is the only bit of data I'm showing you, so don't panic. This is looking at a piece of human skin sitting on a mouse, and it's very healthy and happy. If you inject the mouse with saline, of course, nothing goes wrong. If you put in the human immune cells to reject the skin, then, of course, things change a lot. And this intense green staining is the keratinocytes dividing furiously, which is a sign of damage. If you put in the CAR T regs at the same time, you completely eliminate that damage, and this looks indistinguishable from the healthy skin. And here it is enumerated in numerous mice experiments. This is the rejection. This is the protection with the CAR Ts. So this paved the way for clinical trials, which we've done in kidney transplants and liver transplant recipients, a safety trial, uh, and the profile was safe. And that's led to the formation of a cell therapy company, Quell Therapeutics, formed three years ago. Uh, founders from King's, um, Giovanna, myself, Alberto, who's in the audience, a key player, a uh, group from UCL, a group from Hanover. Uh, a generous early Series A funding from Syncona, a UK venture fund, and then moving on to Series B funding of 150 million from a syndicate, including US funders. And uh, now the company employs about 120 people located in Imperial West, 
uh, and the first clinical trial is starting in kidney transplant patients in KCH as we speak. So an exciting vignette just to show you how fast this field is moving. Before I leave immunotherapy, um, one word about a very interesting and encouraging trial in Alzheimer's, which has been so recalcitrant for so long. This is a treatment with a mouse monoclonal antibody that's been humanized, uh, slowing cognitive decline by 30% over a short time period uh, by dissolving apparently amyloid plaques. So there's real hope in a lot of these chronic diseases. The final area I have to mention is regenerative medicine. Um, and as I'm sure you know, many chronic diseases are caused by the irrecoverable loss of cells from tissues that can't repair themselves. One good example of that is the heart. So if you have a misfortune to have a myocardial infarction, you lose a few billion car cardiac myocytes, the heart muscle cells that are keeping you alive as you sit listening to me tonight. And so because these cells don't divide, you repair this damage by forming a scar tissue. And of course, a scar doesn't pump very well, and so you get heart failure. So we were fortunate a few years ago to recruit um, a very talented Italian scientist who's in the audience, Mauro Giacca, um, who's a man on a mission to persuade cardiac myocytes to divide. Um, and the technology he's employed is small inhibitory RNAs to manipulate the transcription profile factor in these cells and to get them to start to divide. So he started off culturing mouse cardiac myocytes and using robotic screening, found a handful of these inhibitory RNAs that indeed persuaded these cells to start dividing. Went in vivo, initially in mice, and injected these small inhibitory RNAs. And you don't need to be a pathologist to distinguish this heart from this heart. This was the one that had the effective inhibitory RNAs, causing a massive proliferation. Wanting to get closer to the clinic, he then moved into a pig model. The pig model involved blocking a coronary artery for an hour and a half and then allowing it to reperfuse. That causes an infarct, and you can see this purplish patch of dying tissue here. So around this tissue, he either injected the small inhibitory RNAs or saline as a contr control, sewed the animals up, and then four weeks later, performed a perfusion scan using uh, contrast. So the top animal here um, is a control, and you can see that this left ventricle is pumping extremely inefficiently. And I'm not a cardiologist, but I would say the ejection fraction is somewhere down around 20%. The two animals below were injected with the active inhibitory RNAs, and you can see that these ventricles are pumping beautifully with a very respectable ejection fraction. Now, these animals went on to die because the proliferation was unregulated and they got arrhythmias, but this is an extremely encouraging series of first steps on a very important journey. And so this is one of Mauro's slides. That the vision for this is here's an elderly gentleman emerging from a restaurant, having had a large fatty meal on a cold winter's night, clutching his chest, uh, with central chest pain. Instead of taking him to a conventional coronary unit, he gets taken to somewhere which can inject this drug, allowing his heart to repair. So I think there's enormous promise and enormous opportunity. Um, I'm near the finish. The next point I want to make is that translating these discoveries into health and economic benefit can't be delivered by one sector alone. It requires Combinations of basic science, drug development skills, clinical trial capability, pathway redesign, implementation in the health service, manufacturing, and a supply chain. And so sectors need to work together that don't have a great history. Academia and NHS, as, as Richard said, and AHSCs are not doing too badly, though we can do better. But we need now to supplement that with life sciences industries, real estate developers, venture capitalists, and others. Proximity, in my observation, is vital. It's not good enough to be in the same city. You need to be cheek by jowl, as illustrated by the Edinburgh Buyer Quarter, where they've done this really well. And that's exactly what life sciences clusters are about. That is the purpose of a life sciences cluster, is to bring all these agencies together to work well together and effectively to drive innovation into patient benefit. And London's uniquely placed to deliver this agenda because we have all the assets that you'd wish for. We've got world-class universities, terrific research institutes such as the Crick, fantastic hospitals, the regulatory agencies are based here, the financial centres here, life sciences industries are coming to London in a way they've never done before, the cultural sectors here relevant to recruitment of young talent, and we've got a great infrastructure compared, for example, to a city like Boston. So what's happened in London over the last decade is the springing up of such clusters. 
So you'll have seen the towers rising out of White City, which is it's great that it's there. It's where Quell's located and other companies that are rising out of King's. The Knowledge Quarter at King's Cross, Bart's Life Sciences in the old London Hospital, the London Cancer Hub in Sutton, and then the new kid on the block, our own homegrown cluster, SC1. So SC1, we've shaped around three hubs, the Biomedical Hub at London Bridge, Guy's and the University, the Westminster Bridge MedTech Hub, St. Thomas's and the University, and at Denmark Hill, KCH on one side of the road, the Morsley on the other, and the IOPPN, uh, a mind-body hub. We've appointed a chief executive, Georgina Rizik, who's in the audience, who's setting about de developing a really compelling strategy for how SC1 is going to reimagine innovation and address health equity in our local population and have a global impact. And something I never could have imagined, having said 10 years ago, is we're not space constrained. So outlined here is the Snowsfield site at the back of the Guy's Hospital, uh, owned by the Guy's and Thomas's Foundation, now in the hands of a developer called Oxford Reef, totally bought into the life sciences concept. Besides St. Thomas's, a five-acre site, the St. Royal Street site, owned again by the Guy's Thomas's Foundation, uh, in the hands now of developer Stanhope Baupost, totally bought into the MedTech Hub concept. So a really, really fantastic opportunity, and that's replicated elsewhere in London. So as I move to a finish, just back to the population health thing, you remember the relationship between deprivation and health and the importance of economic regeneration in poor geographies. That very much is linked to life sciences clusters because the life sciences industry in the UK employed almost 300,000 people in 2020. Each new life sciences job has a GVA of about 100,000, which is double the average in other sectors. And a lot of indirect jobs are created too. So PwC did a study a few years ago. Uh, in that year, 146,000 direct jobs were created and that led to 200,000 indirect jobs because of the supply chain and so on. So that's the end uh, of chapter two and I hope I persuaded you that we really are at a very interesting tipping point if we seize these opportunities. I want to leave you with one final thought. I'm an optimist, as I think you can tell, and I hope I persuaded you to feel optimistic. Let's be optimistic and let's imagine 10 years from now we have done these things. We've really begun to address the health inequality thing. We've improved baseline population health. We have re-engineered pathways and created a more sustainable healthcare system. And we've got curative therapies turning off some chronic diseases. Great. But we'll still, of course, be left with an aging population that will become frail, even if they have more healthy life years in a more equal society. And I think that what I want to leave you with is the suggestion that we need to anticipate that and begin to think about how to manage the last chapter of life. And so I'm suggesting that we need to do a few things. I think we need a societal conversation about how we manage the end of life, how you die well. Living wills, I think, are part of that. We certainly need to increase our investment in social care. And I think we need creative experiments in design of living spaces and borrow some of the learnings from Holland, which has done some really great things, deliberately housing students and elderly people together. I'm not sure if I'd want to be living next to some of my children but <laughs> when they're students. But anyway, putting that aside, uh, I think you can see that it benefits actually both uh, spectrums of age. So to finish, manifesto, it's a little bit grandiose, isn't it? But uh, what I'm suggesting is that if we take a multidisciplinary, multi-agency onslaught on population health and inequality, including improving air quality and reducing emissions, if we radically re-engineer whole pathways, and of course in incorporating mental and physical health in doing that, double down on the delivery of curative therapies and have this dialogue and smart planning for managing the end of life, then I think the opportunity is really exciting. Now, what I've tried to do in this inaugural lecture of this series is set out the landscape as I see it and the sunny uplands that I hope we're going to move to. But subsequent lectures, I'm sure, will zone in on different aspects of this journey. But I do think it's going to be an exciting journey. Thank you. Thank you.